Hi, this is Lace Watkins, Executive Director of the Lace on Race Center for Racial Equity here with a Lace on Race hot take. Today, we're talking about Juneteenth. As I am filming this, tomorrow, Wednesday, will be Juneteenth. And it has gotten me thinking a lot, not just about that day in 1865, but about Emancipation Day in 1863. There was a full, there was a full two-year gap between putative freedom and when the freed slaves who did not yet know they were free were finally apprised of the situation two years later. This is a big deal. I want to focus for just a moment on the cruelty, the abject cruelty of that act. I want you to think about the idea that someone had gotten something big, something life-changing, and that was hoarded and held back for the aggrandizement of those who oppressed them. That's the story, y'all. And that's where the majority of the people watching me, people who identify as white, should locate themselves. Doesn't matter whether or not your ancestors owned slaves in Texas or in anywhere else. It doesn't matter that you may not have any visceral experience with and so find yourself justified in distancing and displacing when we think about it. And now we just think about Juneteenth as cause for celebration. And it is cause for celebration to a point. As old as I am, I have always known about emancipation, but it wasn't until maybe 30 years ago, half my life ago, that Juneteenth came to the fore and really only the last 10 or 15 years um, in my little corner of the world. Juneteenth really matters. It matters that by the time that two-year trajectory happened, the last cohorts in Texas were finally able to live out something that they already had. Now, this is what I'm going to be focusing on, on my evening devotions tonight and my morning devotions tomorrow. We're not celebrating their freedom. We're celebrating the acknowledgement of their freedom that already existed. Those are two very separate sentences. I want to pivot and I want to pivot hard to the present day. Particularly, we're going to go back a little bit, the last 65 years where things that should have been self-evident turned out not to be as self-evident as we first thought and where people had to be told that's part of the legacy of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Now, technically, both of those things were already assured by the 13th and 14th Amendments um, in the 1860s, but there needed to be new legislation to bring into full fruition those rights that were already extant. We need to talk about that in terms of our present lives, in terms of where we are internally, in terms of our outward praxis, and how we view the world. 
I refuse to use the word permission when it comes to Juneteenth, that, that day in Texas in 1865. I will use the word acknowledge. And, and for our purposes, as we come back into 2022, we can talk about acknowledgement and affirmation. They were already free, y'all. They were already free. They just weren't treated as though they were free. My grandmother, Lacey May, already had the right to vote as of 1920. That would have made her 17 years old. But she didn't actually cast her first vote. This may be apocryphal, but I'm going to go with it. She didn't actually take her first vote until 1960, three years before I was born, so that she could pull the lever or mark the little ballot or whatever they did in South Central Arkansas in 1960 so that she could vote for John F. Kennedy. My mother, who in 1965 would have been 26 years old at the Voting Rights Act, already knew that on paper that she had the right to vote. But did she have the right to self-advocacy? Did she have the right to be able to vote in local and regional elections? We're coming into midterm elections in 2022, and it is imperative that in order to honor, honor the memories and also honor the acknowledgments of greater acknowledgement of freedom for both Lacey May and Bobby Jean, we have to take a look at how Juneteenth is or is not being honored. And I don't mean paper plates made by a six-year-old in an impoverished country. Like um, we saw in Dollar Tree in Lemon Grove uh, in Black San Diego, someone had is this how we celebrate Juneteenth? Just in the same way as Walmart had that Juneteenth ice cream cake. And we're going to talk about conscious consumerism. I'm not actually as 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 geared up as people might think I am. I think it's part of a larger problem. But I want to I want to center on this. And now I want to bring it to us, regardless of how any of us identify racially or ethnically. When it comes to your individual internal self, when it comes to whether or not you feel you can do this work well, whether or not you feel that there are constraints or conventions that keep you from living out your convictions. I'm going to say that again. There's a lot of C's, but, but it's good. You know how much I love alliteration <laughs> and it's late. So whether or not there are constraints or conventions, conventional wisdom, the way things have always been that keep you from living out your convictions. Oh, honey, the day you figure out how free you already are, you are going to do amazing things. You are already free to challenge and critique conventional wisdom and the way things have always been done in the realm of social and racial justice because they weren't working before. When I think about the two years between 1863 and 1865, I can't help but think about the two years between 2020, the Black Spring, when we were liberated again because we were liberated in, in the year 2000, we were liberated in 1991. We were liberated in 1969. Oh my God, so many reset buttons. And the, the last big reset button was 2020, the Black Spring. Acknowledging what has already been, or what should have been, and should have been built upon. And then we see the backlash. Because in order to talk about Juneteenth, we also have to talk about backlash. We have to talk about reconstruction and how that was thwarted and sabotaged in cynical ways by white people that are now waving flags, red, black, and green flags and being really happy. And the, the ravages and the legacies of the end of reconstruction and the brutal enforcement of Jim Crow that led to situations where it was necessary to pass brown 
1964 Civil Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act, necessary for the Supreme Court to uphold um, Brown versus Board of Education, 1969 um, Fair Housing. If we had gotten it right in, in, in 1863, we would not have had to have these things that, if we're being honest with ourselves, are nothing more or less than acknowledgments that one stroke of a pen was not nearly enough. It wasn't enough in 1863, wasn't enough in 1865, wasn't enough in 2020 when everybody got their blood pressure up. And now in 2022, when everybody's blood pressure is back to baseline and they feel like they've got bigger fish to fry, it is going to be, or it has the greatest potential. It has a great potential for being, I'm going to walk it back a little bit. And before I say anything about the 2022 elections, let me give this disclaimer. Lace on Race is a 501c3 um, organization. As such, we do not take partisan positions. We can compare and contrast both policies and legislation as well as people. But we ourselves as an organization do not take specific partisan policies or specific po par partisan positions when I'm speaking in the role of exec as executive director of LORCRE. Neither do I. But I can look at trends. We can look at the landscape. That's fine. And so we're going to do that here. There is a real possibility that it's going to be a bloodbath in 2022 for Democrats and anybody to the left of Democrats. We've already seen it in these primary elections. And we're going to talk about both of those very, very, very soon. But if you are going to celebrate with us in the same way as we also have some other holidays that either have um, national designation with a holiday or without. If we're going to do these things, then we need to look at what still needs to be done. Otherwise, it's just another day for dreams deferred and for white people um, celebrations that most of you, most of you did not earn. The question that we all need to ask ourselves on this Juneteenth, because this is going to run on, on, on the actual day of Juneteenth, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what have we done to buttress and further the promise of 1865? If you are going to give kumbaya hugs to everyone around you and say, yay, we did it. What are you as part of the we doing in the here and now? And if you're going to celebrate, then that also means you need to be sober and contemplative at least a little bit as well. Yes, there is much to celebrate. The very fact that I am sitting here talking to you, talks about the far-reaching implications and, and successes of both the Emancipation Proclamation and of Juneteenth, talks about the, the success of the 1964 and civil rights, 65 Voting and Civil Rights Act. The fact that I'm sitting here in La Mesa talks to you about the success of the 1969 Fair Housing Act. The fact that in San Diego this weekend, there is going to be a Juneteenth celebration. We'll just give it to them. Just give it to them. On Ski Beach, a place where if there was not de jure segregation, there was certainly de facto segregation. I can tell you with absolute clarity that I have never been to Ski Beach without being in a mixed crowd. I've never been to Ski Beach alone. I can count the time that the times on 10 hands. I've been to any San Diego beach by myself. Historically, it wasn't safe for us. Not Pacific Beach, not South Mission, not La Jolla, not Coronado, not Solana Beach, not Moonlight Beach, none of them. Because segregation that persisted beyond the 1969 Fair Housing Acts and technically the end of redlining. 
it is a big deal when worlds expand and when oppression and subjugation, on paper anyway, subtract. But if people don't know that, they won't know it. I can tell you who's never been to Ski Beach. Taco Bell Bobby. She would hold her breath when I would go to the beach with my friends in high school and college. She would hold her breath. This was 40 years ago, and I understood why. I, I knew that for some people it was um, a pleasant surprise to see me on a beach. For some people, it was value neutral. But for the vast majority of people in the late 70s and, and early to mid 80s, I was not a welcome presence. And it didn't matter what the legislation said. Hear that well. Hear that well. It is not enough to celebrate what someone sort of wills into existence with policy or legislation. Policy and legislation by themselves will never do the job. It takes people living it out. It takes people who are oppressed and marginalized. It takes the courage and the risk for them to push envelopes that everyone says, well, the there's no more envelope. They were already free. Ah, no, it takes courage. And then it takes courage and fortitude on the part of dominant culture to make sure that they are welcome and seen. Yeah, it felt really good when I would see, and I did, I did. And it's the same thing when I lived in, in Kensington in Normal Heights in the, in the early 80s to late or mid 90s. There were people who didn't want me in Kensington. <laughs> I felt it. I feel it still in 2022. It's like, I paid a lot of money so that you would keep your ass south of University Avenue. I feel it. But there are people eye to eye who are like, I know what this means. Every day is a Juneteenth. Not just in terms of black and brown people, but for all of us as well. Every day, every day, we need to remember how free we actually are. Because freedom means nothing unless it's exercised. You are free to be the person that you say you want to be. Every day. There is nothing holding you back. So if you need to remind yourself, I'm already free. I'm already free to live out a praxis, to live out principles and convictions, and that there is nothing constraining you or confining you or limiting you from being the person that you say you want to be. There you go. That, for me, is the real meaning of Juneteenth, reminding ourselves that we're all ready free. If you like this content and you want to see more of it, click the like and subscribe button. Click share. Click it all <laughs> on every major platform because we're on all of them. Make sure that you leave a comment below telling me what Juneteenth means for you. I follow an amazing Orthodox Jewish woman when she talks about her from life. And one of the things she says at the end of her YouTube videos that I'm going to start borrowing is, let me know that I'm not alone. Let me know that I'm not alone. The people who have been unkind here in this space and in other spaces, just like there are a lot of unkind people in this Orthodox Jewish woman's feed, where basically she brings us into her life and she shows us how she prepares for Shabbat and her Purim celebrations and she and her husband talking about, talk about living an Orthodox life. 90% of the responses are amazing. 10% aren't. And I find myself wondering if there's more because she does delete and block people who harm her and her people. But I do wonder that. I wonder the toll it takes on her to be able to tell the truth and share about her life. But one of the things she does say is that if you like what you're, what you're seeing, yes, do the usual stuff, like, heart, subscribe, but also let me know 
that I'm not just talking to an empty screen. Let me know that I'm not alone. That's a big deal. And I ask that of you. I don't want to be alone. I know I'm not. But sometimes you need tangible, tangible evidence of the fact that there are people who are rooting for you. Just like in 1865. Just like in Juneteenth. May every day be a blessing to you. May you be a blessing to someone every day. And may every day be a recommitment to living out who you already are and for affirming rights and freedoms and concomitant accountabilities and responsibilities to people who already had them. Can't wait to talk to you in the comments below. I will be around to answer comments once we post this up. I love you all. Happy Juneteenth.